Okay, so this is video number 34 in the lecture series about creating an international sustainable uh, civilization, global civilization. So this video, we're in a section about profits and about the icons in the major religious traditions. These are traditions that are part of Indonesia's Panchasila, their traditions that were part of the um, working group at the Vatican uh, Academy that were working on finding common ground for sustainable development goals. They used Aristotle's virtues quite a bit, which I also do. And um, moving toward a sustainable civilization. Um, so this is what we're working on. And so the last one was Jesus Sermon on the Mount, his coming of age experience. And this one is about Martin Luther King Jr. as a modern day prophet. And it quotes, so I compare him to some of the Old Testament prophets and then Jesus and his letter from a Birmingham jail because he really is conservative. I mean, he quotes from Augustine and Aquinas. He's very embedded in the Western intellectual tradition. And so I'm uh, shocked, disappointed, annoyed at the fact that Aristotle is coming back among college professors, but the majority of Aristotelians, I think, are reactionary conservatives. And this is not Aristotle. And Aristotle does not defend the status quo. He would not defend Western civilization, especially where it is right now, which is driven by greed. There's no way Aristotle would uh, confirm where America is right now and our refusal to be sustainable and our worship of money and our obsession with not taxing the rich. This is not Aristotle, but it definitely has become popular. And mostly it gets that way by demonizing the other, right? By saying, we are not deconstructionists and we are not social relativists and we are not blah, blah. But neither one of those, like they're both wrong. Neither one are even close to where Aristotle is. That's why I was very glad to find this working group at the Vatican. And that's the direction we need to go. And as many people as I can get who listen to my lectures, um, most people will go on into different careers but um, some, I hope some will go on in the intellectual community and be part of this intellectual community that educates future leaders who go on in all the social sectors and give advice to current leaders about how, what we need to do to change up the paradigm we have, especially economics, and the whole cultural values underneath our economic system to a systems thinking, sustainable civilization. But anyway, so let's go back to Martin Luther King as a modern day prophet. Um, okay, so King did have a PhD. He was very well informed about the Western intellectual tradition. He refers to it quite a lot. Um, all right, so King's movement against the segregationist laws in the Southern US, he used the Old Testament prophetic tradition, the principles of the US Declaration of Independence, the US Constitution, Socrates, Augustine's natural law theory, St. Thomas's 
Aquinas, natural law theory, and Aristotle's model of the art of deliberation. He used all of those to give the universal foundation for why uh, demonstrating against the segregationist laws and getting rid of them was the best choice. The Old Testament prophets spoke out against the injustices of their leaders, usually their religious leaders of their day. Moses was a prophet. God commanded him to defy the laws of Egypt and the power of the Pharaoh and to bring the Hebrews from, the, uh, from Egypt to the promised land, right? Uh, Israel. So obviously we've got a lot of controversies about Israel. And I would say that when these holy books, either the Quran or the Old Testament, are used to um, engage in unjust, brutal violence against the enemy, that, that that's not the spirit of either Islam or the Old Testament. Now, there are examples of brutality in the Old Testament, certainly, but that's where Jesus' Sermon on the Mount really, you know, says no. It rejects things in the Old Testament. Plus, the writers in the Old Testament, there are different books and they have different opinions about God. So there's a the priestly position, the priests that worked in, in synagogues, and then the prophets. The prophets were outsiders. They came in and exposed the corruption. So, all right. The focus of the prophets is on the corruption of institutional structure and the demand for justice, lifting up the poor and oppressed. Amos says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Micah says, what does the Lord require of thee? to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Jesus distinguishes between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And when the Pharisees were criticizing poor women because on the Sabbath day, they walked behind the people um, for harvesting the wheat and picked up the extras trying to find some of the kernels that had fallen and not been picked up by the people before them. And they did it on the Sabbath and the Pharisees were condemning these women. And Jesus said, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's good to have a day of rest, but you shouldn't be so legalistic. These women are hungry and and you shouldn't judge them. And you shouldn't focus on petty little details. That's the virtue of sociability, too. Continuing revelation. Each prophet envisioned God in a way that was more universal, just, and merciful. King was expanding the tradition to include treating African Americans as equal citizens under U.S. law. So Christianity was used to justify slavery. There were quotes in the Old Testament about Ham, and and people had slaves. They but but you know, um, Jesus didn't have slaves, and that's where the literalism has us living in the past. Like we have figured out some stuff and wisdom that is is the cloud tradition. Every one of these traditions has. Um, intellectuals that think you've got to adapt the the lessons, the way of life to current realities. Um, so Jesus criticized the Pharisees and Sadducees, but he was willing to accept the punishment. Gandhi resisted the oppression by the British. The British used the Bible and other Western philosophies to justify their racism, their colonialism. Gandhi developed a system of training so that demonstrators would be able to suffer abuse 
and would not fight back. Um, these techniques are still being used today. So there were recent demonstrations by, well, Black Lives Matter, 93% of those demonstrations were nonviolent. But this is where the YouTube age, you can, you can um, tape some of the violent episodes and post them on YouTube and people think the whole movement was violent or 50% of it was violent. It was not. And so, you know, people need to be really careful about misinformation and they need to be careful about, yes, it's a fact there was looting and there's a film about it, but compared to how many people demonstrated nonviolently and stayed focused on the problem, which is the relation between the police and African-Americans. Now, the other broader social problem is that, again, the rich don't pay taxes. The distribution of wealth is terrible. There's a struggling middle class. So wicked people pit the middle class, the lower middle class, working class against the underclass. They always do that. And the Bible condemns greed. Over 3,000 quotes in the Bible condemn greed. So you have the, you know, the root causes are up at the top. And the failure of the nobility, the privileged, to give back, to be just in a way that promotes the flourishing of everyone. And so what they do is they pit them against each other. They trigger fear. So the African-Americans fear the police and the police fear. And, you know, that's not, it only snowballs downward. So, so um, I think that's the prophets, you know, would call that out. And Martin Luther King did call that out after the demonstrations against started out against the segregationist laws. Then he started to demonstrate against greed. Then he demonstrated against the Vietnam War because it was fueled by the desire for wealth, the military industrial complex, people, too many people making too much money on war. Um, might does not make right. Political leaders do not get to define justice and injustice. There are universal natural standards for good and evil. And the Western tradition has, ever since the Greeks or before, has had that as part of its training. So in, the, in Sophocles' Antigone, Antigone commits nonviolent civil disobedience when she buries her brother or she puts dirt on his body because Creon, the king, had said nobody can do that. His body is going to be food for the birds. And that is super sacrilegious in there. That is a horrible thing in their tradition. And so Antigone, I mean, her brother was a traitor. He declared war on, on the city. But or she thought nobody deserves that because that you can't, your spirit can't get to Hades. And so she herself took it on. She didn't hide the fact she got caught and she just had her argument. So the Greek tradition, um, he sees his creation story. There is a natural virtue, decay, that comes before the evolution of human beings. And it has a, it has a natural foundation. So this um, is very much a part of the Western tradition. You don't get to just be, might doesn't make right, basically. Okay, Socrates was killed for corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods. Socrates used the freedom he was given as a citizen of the democracy of Athens to go into the marketplace and question the leaders. He asked them to explain how they're exercising their power and why this is good, just, and best. The leaders could not answer his questions. Their ignorance and corruption were exposed to everyone listening 
instead of improving, instead of, you know, self-correcting, they accuse Socrates of being corrupt. When they claimed they were following the holy books and the will of the gods, Socrates made them explain. When they could not answer, they accused him of being an atheist. When young people began to rebel against them, they accused Socrates of corrupting the youth. <laughs> Kill so, I mean, these are typical patterns, right? Um, Martin Luther King got accused of all sorts of stuff. Aristotle's ethics and politics provide a model of natural justice. Each of the virtues is related to the world, either the natural world or the world of human culture. The virtue of statecraft is the ability to weave together the rich and the poor by making, applying, and enforcing laws about distribution of social goods, punishment of wrongdoing, in a way that enabled as many people as possible to flourish to the highest level possible for as long as possible. Citizens need the opportunity to engage in public life through voting, sitting on juries, having opportunities to engage in debates about current affairs. So yeah, his model of virtue and statecraft does not say, you know, if that you obey whatever laws are there. The laws have to be critiqued in terms of whether they promote flourishing, which is a standard over and above. It's a natural standard. Aristotle did have a theory of natural slavery, but these people were what we would now call people who are mentally challenged and who flourish better in halfway houses. Aristotle said most slaves are slaves by conquest. So the African-Americans in the U.S. were definitely slaves by conquest. Given that they were naturally equal, given that these slaves in the U.S. were naturally equal, segregationist laws are unjust because they're based on the lie that African-Americans are by nature inferior. So Aristotle was used to justify this but he's wrong. Um, a lot of colonialism would say that people in those in the countries, colonized countries are by nature slaves or by nature uh, inferior. So that's why you can make them do all the dirty work. You don't educate them. Um, they're your servants or your slaves. The economic system is unjust because of unequal access to jobs, wages, working conditions, et cetera. So the whole American system was unjust on an Aristotelian model, even though Aristotle was used to justify it. Augustine, eternal law. Augustine said, we're born with innate ideas of justice and injustice. Human beings can try to corrupt our judgments or make evil choices, but the truth remains this, the same. We're born with an innate knowledge of our equality under God. We're all created in the image of God. Any society that does not treat people as equal is unjust. Any society that does not treat um, the leaders are using their free will to choose evil and must be resisted by those who choose good. The Sermon on the Mount, an eye for an eye. You know, Jesus says, an eye for an eye is wrong. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So nonviolent demonstrations is the Christian way to create a more just society. It's also the way that Gandhi chose, right? It's, you know, every major religion should first choose nonviolence. It should first choose diplomacy, preventing problems. It should first choose to make laws that promote flourishing. So you prevent all these problems. You have a problem, first choose diplomacy. You, you can't solve it that way. Okay, nonviolent demonstration. Violence just doesn't solve much. Segregationist laws are unjust. The law is sometimes explicitly treated African-Americans as inferior when you had the Jim Crow laws. Separate but equal, that was not 
you know, the schools were worse, the housing was worse. Sometimes the laws claimed equal access to education, but the way the laws were applied to particular cases led to worse schools for African-Americans. So neighborhoods, this is still true. Neighborhoods with white people had higher salaries and better schools because it was the tax on the real estate, on the housing that paid for the schools. And people wouldn't sell their houses. People in those neighborhoods did not sell their houses to black people. So black neighborhoods had worse housing, they paid less taxes, and so the schools had less money, and they were worse schools. Um, white people would not hire Black people for jobs, even when they were qualified. There was no way to prove it, so the judicial system, the application of the laws, etc., was unjust. Sometimes the proceedings in a court of law are unjust. So there's all these ways that racism can be embedded in a system with, where people can just say, I don't see it, you know, it's not on the paper. A black person might have a right to a lawyer, but a poor person is assigned a lawyer by the state. And it's a terrible lawyer. The lawyer doesn't put in any effort to defend them because they don't get paid any differently if they do a good defense or a bad defense. Sometimes they're found guilty and they receive a worse punishment just because they're black. Although they can't prove that it's a worse punishment and sue because they can't get a lawyer, they can't get a decent lawyer. Sometimes their punishment seems the same as a white person, but the prison is worse and the way they're treated by white guards is worse. The list of inequalities goes on and on preventing human flourishing throughout the society, creating uh, entrenched um, divisions between the rich and poor and uh, terrible social fabric, the unraveling of a social fabric, the, the failure to weave people together, which leads to instability. The art of deliberation. Okay, so... Um, Martin Luther King talked about, before he engaged in demonstration, he tried to deliberate with the segregationists. Um, and he had different kinds of disagreements with the flat out racists and with the white liberals. So the letter is actually to the white liberals because he's so fed up with them. The white segregationists believed in natural inequality. They did everything they could to oppress the blacks, and they were violent. The white moderates agreed that the system needed to a change, but they accused Martin Luther King of acting too fast, trying to bring too much change. And so they could use Aristotle also, because Aristotle said, you shouldn't change the laws too much, too quickly, or people won't obey the laws at all. And this is where Martin Luther King gets so mad. This is a disagreement in the deliberation process. They agree on the goal. It's the right thing, human flourishing, for the right reason. Get, we need to get rid of these laws because we need to flourish. And African Americans aren't just as capable. But they disagree on the right way to do it, and especially the right time, the right place, et cetera. Aristotle said the laws can't be changed too much, but King argued they've already waited 400 years. You know, you, you just could use that argument forever. Now is the time. Um, he, he just got annoyed by that, understandably so. So the letters focused on white liberal religious leaders because King thought they were corrupt or they're hypocrites. King was following the best practices of the Old Testament prophets and of Jesus, and the liberal preachers still would not join the movement. King chose direct action, resistance, because he had tried to negotiate, and the leaders, the white segregationist leaders, refused. Um, powerful and wealthy people benefited from the status quo, so they put pressure on the leaders to resist change. 
They're afraid of the blacks, but they're also just racist. Aristotle's mean between extremes. How would you apply it? Um, one extreme is to do nothing, right? No, oh, gosh, where are we? Okay, one extreme is to do nothing. The other extreme is violent resistance. And so King argues that nonviolent action right now is the middle ground, is the best judgment. Okay, what's his argument? He says, our critics deplore the demonstrations, but not the conditions that cause them. Don't you care about institutionalized racism? You know, there's reasons why these demonstrations are happening. They're not interested in changing all of the institutional oppression. King tried other alternatives. Then he began a campaign. Four steps, right? I mean, he gives a really good argument. And it's this is the argument. This is practical um, deliberation. This is phronesis. This is deliberation, he's saying. Here are the options. Here's what we did. First of all, we gathered the facts. Do injustices exist? Yes, here's the facts. Second, we tried to negotiate. So that was one option, right? Negotiations. But they kept breaking promises. They said they changed, they didn't change. So we thought that was an option, but the people, we are, you know, we're critical of didn't change. So it's not an option. We tried it. It's not an option. Then self-purification. Our option is nonviolent, right? We don't want violence. And so we're training our people. We're giving them workshops. And also we're boycotting economically, which is also nonviolent. We are not going to shop in their stores until they change the laws. Um, then direct action. First of all, they postponed it because there were more promises made and then no follow through on the promises. So then direct action. So I think he gives a really good argument that he tried every other option and he's not, violence is not an option. And direct action right now is the best option. The goal is to get to negotiations. This is just tension, bringing it to people's consciousness, forcing people to make a decision and negotiate and change the system. Because the goal is long-term change. And to have a violent episode is not going to lead to long-term change. That's why we have to train our people in nonviolence. Because just to have a violence will cause that much more defensiveness, resistance to change, threat, you know, fear. And, um, and also even African-Americans would get tired of violence. But it has to change. So the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in the schools. So the Jim Crow laws actually segregated, separate but equal. So he's saying those laws are illegal. And we are demonstrating to get rid of laws that are illegal. We have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. A just law is one that squares with moral laws and with God's law. So Aristotle would agree with that. He would just call it natural law. An unjust law is a law the powerful force the powerless to obey, but they do not obey themselves. This is the golden rule, right? These laws are voted in by a minority, but everyone else must obey. So this goes back to treat others the way you want to be treated. That's Confucius, that's Buddha, that's Hindu, that's um, 
Christian, that's Socrates. So, and that's Muhammad also. So it's just um, spiritually obvious that we all have the peace of the Atman or we're all made in the image of God. And if you make a law that's just might makes right, right? The powerful make it and force the powerless to obey because they have power. That's every spiritual tradition would reject that. And these leaders call it out. A law must might be just on the face of it but unjust in its application. So, for example, technically, when he demonstrated, he got arrested because he was parading without a permit. So, but they applied for a permit and there was no reason that they were denied the permit. And so again, they, they're demonstrated against that law. It looks like it's a harmless law. It's a good law because, you know, you don't want anybody to parade through a street. You don't want people with a bunch of machine guns to be parading through the streets and knocking off uh, non-whites or something. Uh, so, not so. It's all right to ask for a permit to shut down the roads and to demonstrate, but it was wrong because it was just an act of pure might makes right to deny the, the petition. Um, if we want to break an unjust law, we must do so openly, willingly accept the penalty and do it because our consciences demand it. So on the one hand, they were breaking the parading without a permit. Law. But what they demonstrated for was to get rid of Jim Crow laws. So the Jim Crow laws are unjust laws. And even in the American Constitution, they contradict the federal law, right? But you could have a whole federal system while well, they used to have it. When the founders had a federal system that allowed for slavery, and that was wrong. And so Slavery itself was changed, but it took a whole civil war to get it changed. And yet, then they reverted back to Jim Crow laws. And even though they contradicted the Constitution, so they demonstrated to stop having the states enforce these laws. The white moderate, this is what really bothers Martin Luther King. It's obvious, he thinks. You, all white people who say they care about racism need to be involved. And they criticize because it um, it's creating this huge tension. And Martin Luther King says, forget it. The absence of tension is not good if it's based on injustice. The present tension is a phase of transition so we can change the underlying injustices. And this happens with Confucius, Buddha. He criticizes the Brahmins, Gandhi, and we'll see Muhammad. <laughs> so Martin Luther King knows that his letter from Birmingham jail fits into a pattern all the way to the Old Testament. <clears throat> we do not precipitate violence, right? He got accused. We're being violent. That's not true. We're nonviolent. The police are using are using us as an excuse for being violent. Those seeking justice should be protected by from protected from police violence by the police, right? Uh, they, you know, the police should be protecting them because they're nonviolent. Um, and they're not, like the police are the ones being violent instead of protecting them from violence. Um, and then they get accused of precipitating violence. It's terrible. Social change does not occur naturally. It's not like, oh, things will change over time. No, that's not true. It has to be demanded. People do not give up power uh, willingly. 
You have to fight to get it. He's accused of being quote unquote extreme. It's wrong to be indifferent. So again, what's the mean? Indifference to justice is wrong. Successful people, even African-Americans, once they became successful, they just wanted to maintain the status quo. Uh, but that's wrong. People shouldn't, shouldn't want to live in a society based on injustice, even if they themselves have an affluent life. Because the poor become bitter and violent. It, cre it leads to instability. So this is another Aristotelian principle and Socrates also. Injustice over time leads to instability, violence, um, problems. Whereas justice, um, even though there's a transition, there's a tension, over time, it will lead to stability. The role of the church, and this is important because part of the spiritual life, we have the contemplative role, we have the, um, the, the heart, the path of the heart, but the path of action. So all of these traditions include a path of action as part of the tradition. There are people in these traditions who are primarily activists. And they're people who are primarily intellectuals, primarily create social networks that weave together people um, rather than focusing on changing injustices. They focus on creating bonds, trust, and goodwill, and then things will change or they'll change more easily. This church should not be a social club. This is a problem. The church should not focus on the next world and ignore injustices in our world. So another problem with, with climate change, there are people who are saying, all you have to do is turn to Jesus and you'll be saved and you don't have to pay attention to what we're doing to the earth. That's really, it's definitely does not fit with any of the spirit of any of these people. They risk their lives to speak out and change things, expose things and change things. The early church was a threat. The early church was a threat to the status quo and people took risks, right? In the Old Testament, people are killed for standing up for what they believe in or standing up against injustices, corruption. The current church, he says, is an arch defender of the status quo. Well, this is where I myself went to a church where my dad marched with Martin Luther King. And so the church was um, coming out against racism and they were supporting Martin Luther King and his demonstrations, um, his the tensions that he rose in order to get change. Our destiny is tied up with America's destiny and the American dream is all people are created equal and endowed by their creator with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is the American, uh, one of the principles of the American political ideology, analogous, you know, Panchasila is Indonesia's ideology. This one is American. Kings struggle with organized religion. Jesus had that same problem, right? So did the prophets. Um, so did Buddha. Um, so often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I've heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I've watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange and unbiblical distinction between body and soul, the sacred and the secular. And I mean, I agree with them. Look at the stories. Buddha stood up against the Brahmins. 
Um, the, the prophet stood up against the Brahmins. Confucius stood up. This is, um, yeah, those ministers, they're corrupt. They don't know what they're talking about or they're just, they just don't want to bother. They don't care. They care more about stability, order, than about justice. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. So I ask, what do Indonesians think the church should do in relation to the corruption of society and in the political and religious leaders? Certainly the principles of Panchasila can be used as a foundation for criticizing many types of corruption in Indonesia. Do religious leaders advocate nonviolent action? Should they? Were religious leaders involved in the independence movement in 1945? I, I don't know that. I don't know what sort of tradition you have in Islam. How much of it is related to trying to change unjust laws? Um, all right. Politically, here's another way that rhetoric really distorts the truth, and we have to look past rhetoric. Uh, King was a radical conservative. His goal was to make America carry through on its most fundamental principles. He was a political fundamentalist. Speaking as an African-American, he said, Abused and scorned, though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. The demonstrators are standing up for what is best in the American dream and for the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage, thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in their formulation of the constitution and the declaration of independence. Indonesian leaders today should be radical conservatives and demonstrate to promote the principles of Panchasila, shouldn't they? So. It should be the liberals, it should be the people committed to religious pluralism, should be out there in the street. And if the nation starts to, if the politicians start to really give over to Islamicists, to the more extremist, um, intolerant Muslims, the really radical conservative um, Indonesians, especially the ones in NU, Muhammadiyah, I think they ought to get out there and demonstrate non-violently to not even to change the laws, but just to have the politicians stop um, corrupting the people's judgment, stop telling lies about Panchasila, about the spirit of Indonesian culture. Um, and they, you know, they ought to speak up for humanitarianism rather than dualism and puritanism. And they ought to, you know, make good if they think the situation's getting bad enough. Okay, our founders were radical progressives, religious heretics, and political traitors. So Indonesia's founders were, they declared war on their own political system and their traditions. They, um, they were religious pluralists. They, um, in, in the declaration, they refer to nature's God, and they're referring to God as understood by Newton, which I said way back at the beginning, I think, that monism is fine. And monism is a foundation for Indonesia's ideology, and monism is a foundation for 
Americas, uh, although God isn't even mentioned in the Constitution. So that's a big signal that our founders wanted to separate church and state. But they refer to nature's God. Well, they mean they mean Newton, but that can mean monism. Um, so, um, and monism is pluralistic. It's not authoritarian. They were radically progressive. Mr. Sukarno was very progressive. Um, pluralism as a foundation for a democracy was very radical. Um, but leaders ought to be progressive to lead people to adapt to change. And also, in his case, to have an authentic Indonesian Republic that could stand on its own and not internally divide. Even though the king in uh, our founders Oh, even though Martin Luther King was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. And that would probably happen in Indonesia also. This happens in every country based on a set of principles that have been ignored or corrupted by those in power. Conserving a nation's highest principles is usually the opposite of conserving the power and wealth of those in power, right? So usually the status quo has moved away from the original principles because the principles are visionary, right? They ask something of people. They want people not only to change for the sake of something better, but to keep changing, to keep promoting flourishing. Our natural capacity to recognize the truth. Oppressed people cannot re remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom, the recognition that you have equal capacity and you, you need the opportunity to be able to exercise your capabilities. It eventually manifests itself. That's what happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright to freedom and something without has reminded it, him that it can be gained. This is true for women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, any oppressed group. Injustices lead to instability. Justice will lead to stability in the, in the long run. And by freedom, it means the opportunity to, be, to become engaged in public life, to vote, to be on a jury, to get an education, to exercise your natural capacities. All right. Just as Socrates, and this is a quote from the letter, just as Socrates felt it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help people rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So you can fill in the gap, right? The dark depths of religious intolerance and um, dualism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Higher education should provide opportunities for critical thinking and for uniting reason and faith. The way of living and understanding of faith that children learn growing up has to be re-examined in college, removing the intolerance and ignorance and replacing it with knowledge of all the religious traditions in Ponchasilla, the humanist traditions, how the social contract is understood, where it could be changed, opportunities for deliberation about everything being learned, religion, current political issues, the nature of education. So these opportunities are for deliberation, for number four, achieving wisdom through getting students to sit around and talk about their ideas and 
defend them, or listen to other people. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail could be used as one example of how to think about citizenship in a democratic society and how to preserve democracy. So Marif is looking for a curriculum for Mohammedan schools. And all I'm saying is you could consider Martin Luther King's letter because it really is a good document. And it's nice to see similarities and differences between the US and Indonesia. Indonesians would apply it to their own Panchasila, history and culture, and where they want to take their nation to go now. Future leaders need to have the kind of liberal arts education that distinguishes between natural standards of justice, truth, and virtue, as opposed to socially, purely socially constructed standards. They need to identify the corruptions that need changing now and bring about change through nonviolent action if efforts to negotiate don't work. So, and this will always happen, like throughout people's lives. Something will happen, we have to go demonstrate. So, yeah, I, I've demonstrated many times, especially more recently against the Iraq war, against the concentration of wealth. And I think probably next fall or next spring after the election, it's very likely that there will be some very big demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations. S some people might be violent, um, some people will be angry, but I'll be there if it's, you know, to demonstrate to save my democracy because I fear that it's becoming authoritarian which I already fear that. And I I see a lot of demonstrations in the next few years, but uh, we'll see what happens. I hope Indonesia doesn't go the direction of the US, but the whole world is heading that way. And I just hope Indonesia can preserve its tradition. Okay, stop the sharing.